Welcome to the podcast series, Decoding Sustainable Finance, developed and presented by the Novus Center on Business, Human Rights and the Environment. My name is Raquel Bergoa Dias. I am Research Associate at the Nova BHRE and together with my colleague, João Maria Botalho, a Research Assistant at the Center, we will be conducting the interview for this episode. Today's episode will focus on the topic of growing importance and global relevance, climate justice. Climate change is more than a just scientific or economic problem. It's also a matter of justice. In this episode, we will be asking critical questions to understand the multifaceted nature of climate justice. We will explore the concept of a just transition, its impacts on the social contract and the role of finance in facilitating it, all underpinned by the urgent need for sustainable and equitable solutions. Exactly, Raquel. The dialogue around climate change and its impacts isn't just about today. It's about the kind of world we are living for the generations to come. And it is an intergenerational dialogue, and it's crucial to understand that those with least economic resources often bear the brunt of negative impacts, a fact that underscores the immense importance of climate justice. During this episode, we'll be decoding sustainable climate justice. And to address this topic, we are honored by the participation of Daria Shapovalova. Daria is a senior lecturer at the Aberdeen University Law School and the co-director of Aberdeen University Center for Energy Law and the coordinator of the university's Just Transitions Labs. Daria's current research focuses on climate change and energy law with a specific emphasis on just transition. Her professional background includes valuable expertise in energy consultancy and legal practice. Nadia, many thanks for accepting our invitation. And my first question to you is, how would you define a just transition? And why is it important in today's world? Could you also elaborate on how the just transition affects the social contract and the role of financing in achieving a just transition? Thank you so much, Joao and Raquel, for your invitation. It's a pleasure to speak to you. I think there is quite a lot of concepts floating around today, the energy justice, environmental justice, climate justice, just transition. So for the purposes of our research, we're defining just transition quite broadly as a process which facilitates a fairer distribution of burdens and benefits of the transition to low carbon future. And I realize it is quite a broad definition, but this is because a just transition would mean different things for different stakeholders and different communities. And when we look at the academic and policy literature on this topic, there's very often a narrower definition on just transition that focuses more specifically on the workers, the rights and well-being of workers. Whether it's a community around a coal mine that is closing or like here in the northeast, sunny northeast of Scotland today, a region supporting offshore oil and gas operations and energy transition projects, this transition away from fossil fuels has a direct impact on the workforce that is in place um, with clearly bifurcated labor markets. Usually, whether it's a coal mine or oil and gas industry, that would be the main employer in the region. We see a lot of literature in just transition coming uh, on these cases of coal mine closures from the US and Germany, for example. But from a broader perspective, just transition is not just about jobs. It is also about building social consensus around energy transition, around uh, mitigation of climate change and adaptation to climate change, about correcting past injustices and avoiding any inequalities and equities in transition activities. So, for example, we can all agree here together that wind energy is very good for energy transition, but the projects of offshore or onshore wind, for example, should not be exacerbating the existing inequalities. So in February this year, the indigenous Sami people in Norway were protesting in Norwegian government offices because there is a wind farm, the Fossen wind farm that's been constructed in the area where traditional reindeer herding has been happening. And what's more, there was already a ruling from the Norwegian Supreme Court, an unprecedented ruling in October 2021, that said that the construction of that wind farm had been illegal and violated the rights of the Sami reindeer herders, but there is still no remedy. 
And a bit closer to home here in Aberdeen, there is a proposed energy transition zone, which is promising to become this flagship project for energy transition for the region. And it is planned in the south of the city, which is in the area of Tory, which is one of the most socioeconomically deprived areas of the city. And the energy transition zone would see taking away the only green space that the community has, St. Fedix Park. It's a beautiful green area, and it is the only green area available to the inhabitants. And this area is already enclosed by, on one side, a big port. On another side, a big wastewater treatment, which can be quite disruptive to the community life. And now also a waste incinerator. And the Scottish government minister has just last week refused to intervene to address the concerns of the community, and the community is now exploring legal action. So to sum it up, just transition will mean different things for different communities, but at the heart of it is increasing the fairness and reducing inequality in the process of transition. And as for the finance, it will be crucial in the achievement of just transition, and private investors and public spending uh, really need to consider the just transition principles in their activities. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. I think it was very clear and you really talked about a lot of themes that I think are very interesting for our viewers. So my second question comes after what you just talked about. And I want to know, in your view, what are the main initiatives and efforts being made aiming at this just transition? What are the factors that would contribute to a successful implementation? And how can financing be leveraged to support these efforts that we just talked about? There's quite a lot of initiatives happening on Just Transition, both in the public sector and in the private sector as well. So in the private sector, some companies have already started Just Transition planning. So, you know, we have seen the dawn of all the sustainability strategies and ESG strategies, and now the Just Transition strategies is the new fashion. So we see in Scotland, big companies such as the Scottish Power, which is the TSO and the energy giant here has adopted a Just Transition strategy last year. The EBRD has launched the Just Transition initiative in 2020, and they have since really embraced this agenda, both in the policy work that they're doing, but also on the investment side of it too. The public finance will be really key for Just Transition. So in Scotland, the government has integrated the Just Transition principles into its climate change legislation, but it has also instituted a Just Transition Commission, which is supposed to be this independent body advising the government on Just Transition. They have also established a fund, uh, 500 million pounds for Just Transition in the North East and Moray. And this is a region which will be most affected by the low carbon transition in Scotland because it is the region that houses most of the infrastructure related to oil and gas as well. If we look at the wider European level, the Just Transition mechanism, of course, needs to be mentioned. And the first pillar of the mechanism is the Just Transition Fund, which is set, I think, at about 20 billion euros. And the fund will be supporting specifically the territories that will be most affected by this transition to net zero and will be providing some tailored support. And the second pillar is the dedicated InvestEU scheme, which will support investments in uh, territorial just transition planning. And the third pillar is this public sector uh, loan facility, which will combine grants from the EU budget and European Investment Bank and mobilize some private finance to, again, address and meet the needs of um, just transition territories. So there's quite a lot of developments in the space and a significant amount of funding leverage for just transition. But I believe that we also need to look very critically at the legal frameworks that exist uh, because no amount of funding will solve all of these issues. We need to make sure that the legal framework really adheres to the just transition principles, including climate law and policy, including the way we regulate the labor market, social security, public law on licensing and authorization for both fossil fuels and any energy transition projects as well. So there are some issues that investment will not address, such as better community participation involving marginalized communities in decision making and project approval. Thank you so much. And what are the biggest challenges facing workers and marginalized communities during a just transition? And how can they be addressed? Thanks, Raquel. So the first challenge, as you say, is understanding what just transition is in a place. And as we discussed, just transition will differ from place to place. And it's important to develop place-based and evidence-based understanding 
of how just transition is framed and monitored because it is a bit like sustainable development in that it can be used by different stakeholders and groups to advance their own agenda. You know, some can make a focus on justice and some will make a focus on transition and energy and development. So it's the same thing here. There needs to be a common understanding of what just transition means for this specific region. So the University of Aberdeen, I coordinate the Just Transitions Lab, and one of our big projects is on developing specific indicators for just transition in the northeast of Scotland. And we see here that the economy and the society has really been molded by the presence of the oil and gas industry and the energy industry today. In the North Sea, in the UK, the oil was discovered in the 1960s, and since then there, there's been a boom in uh, the offshore oil and gas production. You could see that the city and the region really flourished, the population decline reversed, the economic development has boomed, there's been a lot of investment in infrastructure in the region, the airport, the harbor. We saw statistically, on average, more people were employed in the region than in the rest of the country. There's been higher average earnings in the region than in the rest of the country. But with it also, you know, come the challenges. Of course, the earnings were not higher for everybody. They were higher for men who worked in the offshore industry, but not for women and not for those who were employed outside of the industry, who still had to face higher prices for properties and the general cost of living. And we see real vulnerability in the region to oil price slumps. So in the 1980s and more recently in 2014, when the oil price goes significantly down, so do the prices of housing in the city. There is mass layoffs. There is unprecedented demand on food banks and charities, um, for example. So there is a need to have a bit more forward planning rather than firefighting when we have crises like that. So even if you do not work in oil, your life is still affected. So in our projects, we're working directly with communities, with local authorities, with stakeholders, with industry to try and develop the local just transition indicators. So some of these indicators are around jobs and workforce. So we're looking at employment. We're looking at employment in the traditional oil and gas sector and then employment and green jobs, the training that is available for people who would like to requalify, for example, and social securities that are available. But we're also looking at things like social capital, democratic participation, community revitalization. We're looking at housing and the connections between poverty and well-being. And we are interested in how we can capture these to have a more holistic approach to just transition. So we are now in the process of collating data on the indicators, and we will then be assessing the current policy and finance initiatives against these defined indicators. So we believe that by taking this very place-based approach, we are able to really critically assess the available empirical evidence and also qualitative and quantitative data on how just transition is understood in Aberdeen, in the northeast of Scotland? And what are the similarities and differences between how different stakeholders understand it as well? Because we see some unusual groupings here. So offshore workers, trade unions, for example, work quite a lot with environmental NGOs, even though they have very different approaches to climate. So offshore trade unions are usually pro-oil, environmental NGOs are anti-oil, but both of them work together very well on just transition and advancing workers' rights, which is very strange to see sometimes. So there's a very nuanced local approach to just transition, which we're trying to explore and facilitate as well. So once you understand what the priorities are for the just transition in a specific region, the challenge is then, well, how do we implement it? And this is where regulation and finance will really play the key role. And a big challenge is that our current legal framework and systems are not really built to further just transition because the climate and energy and human rights frameworks are all quite fragmented and are not very coherent. And even when we look at delivering just transition, the responsibilities in the law of who is responsible for delivering just transition is not really clear. So we see that you know, a lot of people are pointing the finger at the industry, but then the industry is saying, well, there is no legal requirements and pointing the finger at the government. And the government is saying, well, it's a local issue and pointing the finger at a local authority. So until we have clear division of responsibilities, we shouldn't really, we cannot talk about real advancement of just transition 
So everyone needs to pull their weight on this one. There needs to be proactive leadership from the industry on this, but there also needs to be much more coherent and clear regulation from the government as well as implementation at the local authority level. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Talking about planning and government action, how can we ensure that marginalized communities are included in the planning and decision-making processes of a just transition? And more objectively, what steps can be taken to address historic inequalities? Well, this is a particular challenge and a very loaded <laughs> question. So first, we need to really reform the way we make decisions and grant authorizations to industry projects and energy infrastructure. For example, if currently there is a license or authorization, a permit for offshore oil development in Scotland, the decision is made by the UK government. If there is a large scale onshore wind farm somewhere you know, in the forest in Aberdeenshire, it will be the Scottish government that will be making that decision. So local communities do not really get a lot of power in decision making here. How do we put value on social capital? How do we put value on enjoyment of green space? How do you include these values in a process like, for example, environmental impact assessment? It's not really built for addressing and including community values, really. So we need to really reform the way we are making decisions on these crucial infrastructure projects. These projects will define the way we transition into low carbon future. And if we are serious about just transition, then we need to reform these processes to make public participation more effective, more accessible, and more open to including values that have not traditionally been included previously. Secondly, we really need to recognize here, as you say, the historic inequities that exist. So going back to the example of energy transition zone and Tory that I have discussed before, in the 1980s, part of the historic Tory fishing village has been bulldozed to give way to what is now an oil terminal port. And it had been opposed by locals at the time, but it still went ahead. And then they built a new harbor, and then they built the waste incinerator. So the industry is developing all around the community. And even though these are all the different industry actors, it's not the same you know, company that's doing all of this. Sometimes in the eyes of the community, all the industry becomes you know, lumped into one. So when a new actor comes and says, oh, we want to develop this here, the community has memory. The community might not necessarily always trust you know, new investors that are coming in. And it happens all around the world. You know, if a community somewhere had a bad experience with an oil spill 30, 40 years ago, and now an energy company comes with a solar panels or onshore wind farm, the community might still not be very trustful of these investors. So when the industry player comes in, they really need to do some research and do a lot of preparatory work on how the community maybe has in a past experienced exposure to industry. And it's very important to note here that any public participation is essentially a donation of time and effort and expertise on part of the community, whereas for the industry representatives or for the local authorities, their job and they're paid to be there. So when you're announcing a consultation meeting, for example, people in order to come there, they need to take time off work, take time off you know, being with their family or enjoying their hobbies. They need to learn about the project. They need to show up. They need to you know, provide you with their expertise, expertise, with their thoughts. So if the consultation is then done as a box taking exercise and none of the comments that have been put forward are then acted on, the community does feel you know, tricked and feels like maybe the time was wasted here and it shouldn't be a surprise that a community doesn't want to participate anymore or if there is a position to a specific project. So there should be positive obligations for authorities and industry to really ensure that marginalized community is engaged and participates on their terms whatever those terms may be, and it will be different for each of the community, this will require a lot of participatory work and might potentially increase the cost of the project. But again, if we want to beat the drum of just transition, it needs to happen. Thank you so much. And you addressed the role of the public sector and did that follow up 
what role do you see the private and the public sectors playing in a just transition and how can companies and governments be held accountable for their environmental and social impact during this transition and could you also discuss the financing mechanisms such as green bonds and carbon pricing and their potential role in the founding transition uh, thanks, Raquel. So as I said, I think there really needs to be a synergy between the private and the public sectors within the just transition. I don't think there are currently any mechanisms to really hold anyone accountable for non-achievement of just transition because the obligations on, on the achievement of these principles is not really delineated properly. So I think the first step for this is to really clarify the legal framework. We have some examples of where this has been happening with regards to human rights, indigenous rights, environment. So for example, quite a lot of international financing institutions, including the IFC and the World Bank and the EBRD have specific guidelines and requirements for the projects that they finance in terms of human rights and uh, environmental impact assessment. I think that the developments on including the conditions in there on just transition is something that is that should be developing at a much faster pace. I think especially with the development of the Article 6 of the Paris Agreement mechanisms in the climate finance as well, the role of just transition needs to be much more prominent because we do not want to just throw money at the problem. We want to make sure that any projects that are geared to bring us closer to net zero are done with communities in mind and not just with some abstract sustainability in mind, but with very real positive consequences, not just for the climate and energy security, but also for the communities that house projects like that. Many thanks for all your answers. And to sum it up, uh, what would be and what would you point as the two biggest uh, takeaways to highlight for our listeners after this session? Thanks, Joao. I think a big takeaway here is that we shouldn't be distracted by the buzzwords, whether it's sustainable development or just transition or energy justice, but we need to really focus on making sure that the transition to a low carbon future is done in a more democratic way. We cannot apply the same standards to energy projects today as we did 20 and 30 and 40 years ago. The game has changed. And despite a lot of negative conversations, I do have quite a lot of hope and I see quite a lot of very positive developments around the world. And I think that more early career scholars and professionals like yourselves are playing a big role in bringing us to a brighter future. Thank you. And I think with that, we've come to an end of another enlightening episode of Decoding Sustainable Finance. I think we've dipped deep into the world of uh, climate justice here today, isn't it, Raquel? We would like to express our sincere gratitude to Daria, who joined us as today and shared their invaluable insights. Your expertise is not just illuminating, but inspiring, as we strive to understand and contribute to a just and sustainable future. Remember, climate justice isn't just an issue for the few. It's a global concern that calls for global action. So thank you for being with us. And until next time, keep decoding sustainable finance.